Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion. We have three lovely speakers, we're, and we're going to be discussing plastic and food waste. Thank you all for coming. Yes, hello. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm Lorena, and Don Royster just spoke. We're oh. from Zero Hour Orlando, so thank you guys for joining us, and we'll start off by introducing some of our incredible panelists. And we can start with introducing Lee Perry. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Perry, and I'm the Chief Operations Officer of Ideas for Us. I am here uh, so excited to talk to you about how one of our programs, Fleet Farming, incorporates food waste. And also, we upcycle a lot of our materials that we use for trellising and things like that when we're growing food in a hyper-local area. So really excited to talk to you all about that. Thank you, Lee. And now I can introduce JD Chen. Hi, everyone. I'm JD, and I'm representing the City of Orlando's Zero Waste Team. Um, today, we'll be talking about reducing and reusing and how the city can actually help you with that. We have food waste programs, we have composter programs, and we haul our recycling in-house, and we can touch more about that later. Thank you for having me. Thank you, JD. And now I'll present Charlie Pioli. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Pioli, the owner and founder of O-Town Compost. Uh, we're Orlando's community composter, collecting and processing food waste and converting it into black gold and uh, you know we're waging a war against plastic trying to promote convertible uh, compostable serviceware items and dog bags but overall we're just trying to divert waste from the orange county landfill so to start off with today's first questions what is a major way in which you guys have um um implemented practices to reduce your plastic consumption? Okay, I'll start off. So I would say most of the things that I own in my house, I took from the trash. And that sounds really radical, but I actually would love to brag about that to most of my friends because I take a lot of pride in that opportunity to upcycle materials that I know otherwise would have gone into the landfill. Um, I've always wanted my own really good quality uh, dining room table. You know, they're usually very expensive and I've never really had the ability or the budget to buy a really nice one. And I found one recently on the side of the road that was real wood and really beautiful. And every time I walk by it or have a guest, I tell people that that was from the trash because it's, it's sort of a symbol of how many incredible things people just disregard and throw away um, that could mean so much to somebody else. And so, you know, when you're just thinking about um, how we're marketed to and how people kind of target us to, you know, sell us merchandise, it's, it can be incorporated in a marketing plan for a business, which, you know, we live in a capitalistic society, so that's that's important, right? We need to generate revenue and we need to make money and we need to sell products in order to pay people livable wages to succeed in life. But if we can find other ways to combat some of our environmental challenges, like all of the waste that goes into landfills, that in and of itself can become a business model that can employ people and pay people a livable wage. It's just about the demand and it's about the individual's behavior and what we do at home that can then spark a movement and create that demand for other more conscious capitalism. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think, um, you know, as an individual, I'm an anomaly. I, have eaten out of the Aldi's dumpster for about three years running, um, buying only, you know, 10% of my diet comes from buying things at the grocery store, whereas 90% comes from the dumpster. But I think uh, waging war against plastic is 
you know, looking at our consumption and um, I know single use is quite the trend here in the United States. So uh, really putting pressure on the corporate entities, hotels, you know, when you go to a uh, continental breakfast, you're bound to encounter uh, styrofoam bowls, single use utensils, all these plastic items that just be, are thrown away, just putting pressure on the corporate entities to convert to at least a biodegradable or compostable plastic. And O-Town Compost, uh, we do sell these uh, compostable plastics that kind of supplement the single use plastics. Um, so, you know, if you look at the United States, it's all about convenience and you know i don't i don't suppose we're gonna get over that anytime soon so in the meantime at least try to go compostable adding to charlie whenever you talk about convenience i think people forget that plastic water bottles although they're everywhere and you could easily buy one is it not much more convenient to have a water bottle with you at all times if you're thirsty i Sometimes I'm in a car and I get really thirsty and then I forget that I left my bottle of water somewhere, um, usually in the house. And it's, I can't imagine a time when I wasn't using the water bottle. So to me to go out and buy a very expensive cup of water is ridiculous whenever you could save that plastic and save your money in the long run. Another way to reduce plastic is to buy things that ne don't necessarily have the plastic on them. Whenever you go to get produce or buy um, anything at the store, I tend to look for things that don't have a bunch of plastic wrapping, but sometimes that's hard because again, the corporations, um, they wrap it for aesthetic and also for safety purposes. And that's something as an individual, we can't necessarily change overnight. You can change your own behavior overnight, but you can't change the behavior of a corporation or of an entire city overnight. Um, so it's, it's hard whenever we have these conversations about reducing plastic consumption at the individual level, because yes, we do have an impact. Each one of us does. But at the end of the day, it takes both sides of the coin, the corporation and the larger entity part and the individual section. I think you really do vote with your money. Um, so whenever you support companies that are trying to be more sustainable, we were just talking about Ben and Jerry's, how they're a B Corp and they're on the right side of things. Um, if you support them over say another ice cream carton, you're still eating ice cream at the end of the day but you're going to choose an organization that aligns with your values. And so whenever you go purchase anything or in this consumer society, it's hard to talk about not buying things because a lot of things we can't necessarily grow ourselves or we can't necessarily build or create ourselves. So we do need to go out into the market to buy something. It helps to understand where things are coming from and what these organizations believe whenever you give them your money. That was a really great point that JD made, like considering that when we're battling, you know, this battle against reducing plastic consumption, we really need both initiatives from individuals and corporations. And so we need to consider, especially with the coronavirus pandemic, how plastic has skyrocketed during this time. And so I want to talk about what their opinion is on what direction plastic now has because of the pandemic. So we can start off with Lee. Well, it's really disheartening to see, uh, you know, masks and gloves on the side of the road or in parking lots and, and to see that people are, you know, consuming so much plastic in that regard. Um, you know, I think the pandemic in and of itself is sparking a lot of conversations around the environment, especially with wet markets and with large scale agriculture. Um, but with regards to plastic consumption, 
you know, it's, it's a really challenging thing because, you know, plastic in, in its inception, using it really helped the medical industry advance. And so it was in its day, this really incredible tool, especially not just in the medical industry, but in the home, you know, um, Tupperware and food containers were revolutionary because people did throw away a lot more food before they were able to refrigerate it and store it properly in plastic containers. But where, where we went wrong was that um, feeling of security when something is wrapped in plastic. This, this false sense um, in some cases that it is more sterile and clean. I've seen some things that are just really ridiculously overwrapped in plastic because they think it will sell better, like limes, for example. Um, and, and with regard to the coronavirus, I think that there's two levels of consciousness that are advancing and going backwards. So people are more conscious of their health and they're more fearful for their health and safety. So plastic consumption is on the rise. But at the same time, I think that more and more people are starting to question our impact on the environment, seeing this pandemic advance in the way that it has been. And so people are slowing down to really take a pause and think about our impact. And I've seen people innovate. I've seen them make their own masks. I've seen them do tutorials on how to make their own mask and, and upcycling you know, different materials to be resourceful during this time. So it's a really good conversation to have right now. Building off of Lee, I, I agree with people building, uh, making their own masks whenever, um, like during this entire pandemic. I also see a lot of people reusing uh, their plastic because they want to they want to stay quarantined so they don't necessarily want to go out. And gardening has also spiked during this time as well, which is a plus um, if, if food safety is another, food security and food safety is another issue that arose because of the pandemic or it was already happening, but more people um, realized how important it was and really understanding where food comes from and how less plastic you use whenever you grow your own food. It's, it's an idea that is kind of common sense, but not a lot of people even thought about it because it was just really convenient to go to the grocery store and pick up that bag of zucchini when that bag of zucchini doesn't necessarily need to be in a bag, you can just pick it up. And another aspect of plastic use during COVID I noticed is the bulk sections have, they're no longer bulk sections, they're in plastic bags because it's considered cleaner. Um, in a way, it does reduce the amount of people touching the same scoop um, over, but an easy fix is just to have someone clean it regularly. Um, you don't see a lot of people using the bulk section anyway, at least um, not during this time. So if they have the ability to have someone staff to clean the carts because everybody is cleaning carts now, it's not that much more difficult to have someone staff to clean those handles. And if you think about it, people are touching produce too. And just because you put it in a plastic bag doesn't mean it's completely clean. You have to go home and wash it anyway. So that whole idea that plastic is more sterile is it's a myth. And it's just an idea that people aren't used to. And it definitely takes education and awareness to break that mind habit that people have. Yeah, and I just want to mention that, you know, the one side of the coin looks at plastic as, uh, you know, quite an innovation. It's a flexible, lightweight, pretty durable, strong material, but I, th and it's been used really well in the making of a, a lot of things like cars and, you know, replacing like a, a steel fender which burns a lot of fuel versus a plastic fender or, you know, for transport, plastic can be really 
more environmentally friendly just by making the vehicle more lightweight. But I think where the United States has gone wrong is making every little product uh, that we use just once a disposable and plastic. And if we could get over that single use plastic, I think we could be, you know, much uh, more sustainable. On that note, Charlie, you have a um, question from the chat. Um, someone is asking, since you deal with composting, is there a way an individual can contribute food waste to your organization in lieu of buying a compost bin? Um, yeah, I don't uh, sell compost bins per se, but I do sell the, the subscription service for residential clients. Uh, um, there is, unfortunately, we don't have a drop-off location. We're just too busy uh, with our collection. And um, I would just say that hopefully in the fall, we'll, have, we'll be starting a drop-off location at the Soon Union Center at UCF uh, for about two hours every Friday. Um, so keep your eye peeled for that. But otherwise, I would encourage you to email our website. And if you can't afford the subscription, you know, um, definitely let me know. We give out, you know, the first month free, a promo code that can hook you up with the first month free. So definitely contact us at info at otowncompost.com. So since you, we already covered how we can directly influence corporations, moving on, something I found surprising that I think a lot of people don't know is where most of our food waste comes from. So does anyone want to tackle that first? I know most people are probably looking at me being the, the food waste guy. Um, yeah, I would say it's not like it, it's very evenly spread among the different generating sectors of our economy. You got to look at it from the, the production standpoint, the, the farms that actually produce these um, vegetables and fruits that, you know, they have to glean them for like the perfect looking vegetable. So there's a movement out there kind of accepting ugly fruits and vegetables. That makes a huge impact at the, the farming aspect. Then you move on to the transportation. I mean, usually a farm sends their produce to a distributor and the distributor is the middleman that sends it on to the grocery store. And that distributor, you know, there's waste there because things may go bad. They do their own gleaning process and uh, some stuff is just shucked to the side. And then I think I would say a significant portion of the food waste in this country, at least 25% is in the consumer's fridge. That's me or you. Um, we just buy stuff from the grocery store, let it sit in our fridge and never get around to cooking it or to consuming it. And that is something that we can directly impact. Uh, we can more indirectly impact at the, the agricultural level. But as long as we're just, you know, really being watchful of what we consume from the grocery store, and um, not trying to buy too much. You know, maybe you subscribe to O-Town Compost so you have an outlet for your food waste. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's what I would say. But JD definitely uh, is also in the food waste realm, so. Thanks, Charlie. So about 40% of our food waste generated in the United States is wasted. So that's nearly half the amount of food that we make and consume gets thrown away. And it is a lot on the consumer side that gets wasted, probably more than half. 
um, of the food in the United States is wasted on the consumer side. And that is partially due to the mindset that if it looks bad, like Charlie was saying, the misfit produce, we don't necessarily consume. And that goes back to the supply and demand. It's not necessarily the farmer's fault or the um, the uh, middleman fault for doing that because consumers won't buy the ugly produce. And that's directly on us, the consumers. Um, but like Charlie said, there's an outlet for those and you can buy mis misfit produce now and have them shipped directly to you. Another aspect is that these Best Buy and expiration dates on food, there's a misnomer in those because that doesn't mean the food is bad. And I find that a lot of people, they go, they do go through a fridge clean or a freezer cleanse and they see anything with a date on it. And if it's past that date, they throw it away. But whatever food that is, that doesn't mean it's bad. Um, my mom used to joke that back in the day, they would just smell the food, taste the food to see if it was bad. And then if it was bad, they would throw it away. But nowadays, a lot of my peers and some of those older and younger than me just see the date and they toss it. And that's very wasteful for both your money and for food waste, because food waste, once it goes to landfills, it releases methane gas, which is about, I would say 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. 40% of our food goes to landfills and about a third of landfills are filled with food waste. And that's a lot of methane gas that's being produced. And there are some landfills that capture that methane gas to produce energy, but it's not completely regulated. So they aren't required to do so. So all of that methane gas that could be converted to energy gets wasted and goes into the atmosphere and yeah and I just want to debunk that whole like capture energy um Orange County landfill captures the methane but most of the methane is released within the first seven days of you know it being this uh, it being thrown away so they don't really hook those pipes up you know they drill wells into the landfill and they hook up a piping system that is meant to kind of funnel the gas up through the the wells and that what that well is what captures it and burns it off as biogas for electricity but all the methane gets released in the first seven days and that um doesn't really get captured you know, just a tiny fraction of it actually gets captured for electricity. So don't let the big waste haulers fool you. It's not a sustainable way of managing our waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something I'd like to add too about how people might see these problems and think they are so much larger than themselves as individuals. What I always try to put into perspective is just think about the process, right? You have farmers who own land who have various seasons in nature that they have to anticipate, right? Their winters, their springs, their summers, their falls can be inconsistent, especially now with climate change. So they have to anticipate the weather in advance. They have to anticipate what stores we're at will actually buy. Sometimes they have contracts with big, you know, distributors, um, and sometimes they don't. Maybe they have a contract where they have to produce X amount of cucumbers, but one year, but then the next year, oh, that supplier changed their mind. Now the distributor wants kale. And they basically, the farmers are forced to either sell at a price point where they don't make a profit, or they have to unfortunately throw a lot of that produce away and they rely on migrant workers who make pennies on the dollar some as low as eleven thousand dollars a year to sustain that model now in the meantime you have the actual storefronts that have to anticipate shelf space every single inch of shelf space in your grocery store is a price to them and they can only anticipate certain income based on that 
shelf space being full and based on the number of people walking through the door. So what happens is if they get a delivery and they anticipated kale was going to sell well this year and kale isn't selling as fast as it was, well, they ordered a bunch of kale and that kale's coming in. So you got to get it on that shelf nice and fresh. So all the other kale that might not be expired now goes into the trash, which is why Charlie, yes, he's dumpster diving and I've done it too, but it's still really great food. And it's a lot of food. I'm talking every night, like nine large scale, large 50 gallon trash cans worth of ice cream being thrown away, for example, in one night. So you have to remember that whole process is all contingent upon your dollar, you as an individual. What are you buying? Where are you going? Where are you spending your money? Now, if you go to a local farmer's market and you put that money towards a local grower who is busting their butt trying to make a livable wage selling produce, which is already very undervalued, you know, they, they're going to be hyper local. The steps between getting that food from the ground to your plate are much smaller steps than an industrial large scale monoculture farm that's 1500 miles away, right? That has to be wrapped in plastic or, or, or harvested way too early in order for it to make it on a plane or on a bus over to the grocery store. So we have to remember all of those things and, and spend with your dollar a little bit smarter, right? And ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and one of, the, one of the main things that I wanted to bring up too is, is um, food uh, packaging delivery services. When I first started, uh, I, I used one of them, I can't remember the name of the brand, but I realized how much they wrap everything in plastic. And when you're shipping something, that's another step from the grocery store to now the packaging company to your door so that you can have either prepared meals or you can have uh, make your own prepared meal with a recipe. And that's another step that's more greenhouse gases being, being emitted and et cetera. So, um, you know, I just want to put those, that whole process into perspective for the average consumer. And I just want to put that whole process under the bus because they advertise like they're recyclable packaging and they, they aren't. It's flexible wraps and styrofoam stuff that is not recyclable in any program around the country. And I would encourage uh, the listeners to take a drive down I-5 throughout the Central Valley of California, I mean, you'll see um, where the majority of this country's food comes from in that one region of the, the country. And you'll be stuck behind almond trucks where, where the husk of the almonds are blowing on your windshield. You'll be stuck behind uh, tomato trucks where they take a, a left turn too sharply and they litter the road with tomatoes that are wasted. I mean, it's, it's just, that's where the industrial food system really lies. And I would say that's where you should get a firsthand glimpse. Well, I think Charlie brought up a really good point that I really wanted to talk about was like, considering how, you know, when we're talking about recycling and understanding like misconceptions with recycling, especially where most of our recycled products go. I don't think a lot of people realize that a lot of what we recycle actually ends up being sold overseas. So I would love for you guys to share your take on, you know, talking about this misconception that people have about not knowing that most of our recycled trash ends up going to countries overseas. So I can touch on that a little bit. As for City of Orlando, um, because we haul our own um, recyclables, we take them to a um, 
a recycling facility in Brevard County. And we don't process any of it, but they do the processing and they go through waste management to do so. In terms of the plastic being shipped overseas, there's, I understand why it's being shipped overseas because there's a market for them. Um, there are certain countries that will buy the, um, the plastics and the other um, broken up materials or assorted materials. In terms, I'm sure a lot of you have heard in the news that this is probably a, a while back now, but China stopped accepting plastics from the entire world. And that's because there was a lot of contamination. And that doesn't necessarily mean that now in America, all of our recyclables are going into the trash or going to landfills instead, but rather it's, it's not like a fault, like who's at fault anymore. It's just educating people to let them know what can be recycled and what can't be recycled. And it's not um, according to the number or the recycling symbol on the bottom of your containers. It's very specific to your region and to your county. Um, for instance, here in Orlando, we take plastic bottles that have a neck and if you put the cap on, then it can be recycled. Whereas some on the East Coast or the West Coast, that may not be true. And so I would very much caution people to check their city's websites and check their solid waste division offices websites for what exactly can be recycled. The city of Orlando does have a database where you can search exactly what item you're trying to recycle and the database will tell you if you need to throw it in trash, if you need to throw it in food waste, if you can recycle it, or if you need to go to the landfill because it's a hazardous waste item. So a lot of it is awareness of where um, and what you need to recycle or what you just need to reduce overall. Yeah, and I would say my background is sol in solid waste and recycling consulting. And I've been to a lot of MRFs, uh, their ma ma material recovery facilities, aka recycling centers around the country. And uh, yeah, I mean, ever since China just put up the green fence, they call it, about two years ago, um, recycling has been suffering economically. And recycling, don't get it wrong, is an economic business. And that's how we've managed it to work in this country. I mean, um, you know, it's an economic business, number one, and it has environmental benefits, number two. So you look at a lot of the recycling centers around the country right now, they're suffering economically and they're sending their material, that stuff we bring to our curb. And, um, you know, they're, they're either sending it through their processing line and they're separating it only to like, there's some commodities out there like aluminum cans, steel, cardboard that are being shipped to the nearest port and ending up overseas where they remanufacture it and send it back to America because America has the strongest consumer demand. But it, it's very nuanced county to county, city to city. And Orange County, I know probably most of the watchers are uh, from Orange County. The Orange County jurisdiction, unlike the city of Orlando, is sending the majority of our recycling loads to the landfill and not recycling it. And what they're doing even worse is they're shipping it all the way to Brevard County, the coast, like Cocoa Beach, and they're dumping it on the floor. A guy is visually assessing it with a clipboard and saying, no, that's above 20% contamination. Uh, we're not gonna accept that. So they scoop it back up, put it into a transfer trailer and transfer it all the way back to Orange County's landfill, which uh, is in East Orlando. So it's not only is it the gas fuel burning each direction, but it's also just like not <laughs> being recycled. But uh, you know, I I love to you know say the misconceptions of recycling, but I'm an avid recycler myself. 
There's great things that you always need to recycle, like your aluminum cans, steel cans, cardboard, uh, plastic bottles with the neck, like JD was saying. And, um, but you know, I would argue that food waste, especially if there's a community composter or someone local who's turning that back into the soil locally is a, has a lot more environmental benefit than, um, you know, the global economy of the recycling markets. If I can add to um, Orange County's recycling, the reason why they have so many problems with it and they're sending it to landfill is because of contamination. Um, they are trying to fix it. So they're, um, Jeff is trying really hard, but um, because in Orange County, recycling is mandatory. So single family homes are required to have recycling bins. People treat it as a second trash can. So instead of putting recyclings in them, they put garden hoses, old children's toys, which both of those are not recyclable. Uh, to some people that's confusing, but it's very true they are not recyclable. But yeah. because it's mandatory, you can't force people to recycle properly. You can give them the option to recycle properly. And I think that's where the disconnect is. Um, people either don't care or they're just not aware that that can't go in recycling and that will cause other people's recyclable goods to go to landfill. And I should mention that um, I was working on the, the recycling cart monitoring program in Orange County. Um, Orange County was funded by a lot of grant money so they could clean up the contamination at the recycling cart among their residents. And we were lifting bin lids of recycling carts and, you know, giving people feedback. Um, I would, I would say that, that Orange County realizes that universal recycling, giving everyone a recycling cart is not the right way to go. Cause a lot of people don't deserve a recycling cart. They should be, um, their recycling cart should be taken away. And basically what this program was doing is assessing people who continually to have offensive contamination. Eventually, you know, after week four, we take away the recycling cart, upcharge them on their garbage bill. And then um, we ultimately just say, hey, if you don't want to recycle, then we're just going to increase your your garbage rate and i think that's the approach to do it because uh you know people will take advantage there's the freeloader problem of economics and i think compost you know ultimately we want to make orlando a city where everyone has access to compost or food waste recycling but you can't do it um, like recycling has been done. You need to gradually spread out access across the county or the city of Orlando and only give it to those who actually are willing to participate, not use it as their second trash bin. So We have a couple questions from a couple of viewers. Um, we have a question that says, doesn't PLA, which is polylactic acid plant-based products, contribute to methane um, release and also land clearings impacting natural habitats? Um, I know PLA is, you know, a, a great alternative to just regular petroleum plastic. I think PLA is is bioplastic right so i'm really not sure about its uh emissions greenhouse gas emissions but i can uh definitely say that it's not like a or it's kind of an inert material that breaks down faster than plastic would so it it will definitely it'll be a a minor a factor in the mission sector, so. The, okay, 
So with um, bioplastics and items that say compostable on the bottom, even though they look like plastic, they are compostable, but you can't put them in your backyard compost. And you, could, you can't put them in um, food waste compost because it doesn't break down uh, similarly to the other food waste. We don't have a commercial compost facility in Orlando that does take compostable like bioplastics. So that's, that, there's a market. So if you, if someone out there will create this um, facility that does process that there's money to be made because bioplastics are increasing in demand. A lot of uh, restaurants are switching to bioplastics instead of regular, regular single use plastics. And so when it comes to the methane emissions part of it, anything that goes to landfill and gets covered by the protective layering will contribute to methane and carbon dioxide emissions. So at the end of the day, yes, they do. However, it's still, like Charlie said, it's still so much better than single use plastic. And it's kind of that whole gateway idea. Again, if you're thinking about compostable materials instead of single use plastics, what else is it affecting in your life or what else is the organization going to think about that will improve the environment? And as far as that centralized composting facility, I mean, Orlando, Orange County doesn't have the infrastructure to really recycle food waste right now, which is exactly why I started O-Town Compost is to build that infrastructure, or at least create enough demand so one of these municipalities would step in and provide it. And, you know, that's the goal, just communicating with city of Orlando and Orange County is we're going to get there in the next couple of years. So, you know, mark my word. <laughs> well, one, one major thing that I want to highlight is that there is an anaerobic digester that is run uh, by Disney called Harvest Power. That is an incredible facility that I had the pleasure of touring in December. Um, if you ever get a chance to tour it, it's very innovative, extremely impressive to see such incredible amounts of ingenuity that has gone into this facility. And they're able to take a large amount of food waste and turn it into energy to power homes. Uh, literally, Javier, one of the gentlemen who runs the facility, mentioned that after Thanksgiving, they get truckloads of non-eaten turkeys shipped in from Walmart and things that weren't purchased because of that, you know, overproduction, which is just crazy to me, um, that there are literally turkeys whose lives were simply just for this fact that they were going to be turned into energy. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, they have created this resource. And, you know, I think every major problem that we have here on this planet could be turned into a business plan that could be uh, a solution to something else if you think hard enough on it and there's an incentive to do so. So, you know, I'll be interested to see the comparison in numbers between that and a solar farm or by a, a nuclear power grid. And, and just do a, a really deep dive comparison on, on those systems. Um, but something else I wanted to contribute as well is, is that, you know, for those of you who are not as savvy with, you know, all these different methods of food waste recycling and recycling plastic waste, just think about your everyday decisions that you make when you wake up. You know, when you take something and you just, out of sight, out of mind, it's gone, you know, that is a problem somewhere else for someone else, right? If you can think about it and do the opposite, where, like I said, you take something out of the trash that you can use and reuse or upcycle, and you take a photo of it and you post it on social media and actually show people that you are being a smarter consumer and you know reversing your footprint on the planet you're going to market this movement even more so so that more people will feel more comfortable to take things out of the trash you're going to break down that stereotype and create an incentive 
So just, just think about that step-by-step -step behavioral shift in your, your daily behavior. Yeah. And um, you don't mind if I tell a story real quick, you know, in my, my consulting career, I was at the border of, you know, Joplin, Missouri, right on the border of Oklahoma and Kansas, a tornado hit the day before and leveled a couple barns. And we're talking near uh, a million chickens and turkeys being shipped into the landfill because they just got wiped out by the debris and by the tornado. And all this, you know, all this resource and energy just being brought into the landfill because it was the best solution. There was no infrastructure in place. It was just like really a shame to see that. And, you know, that's why we need the infrastructure in place. Number one, anaerobic digesters are great. I think composting from an environmental standpoint is better because not only are you creating like a, a soil amendment, but, um, you know, th that soil amendment is sequestering car carbon from the atmosphere. Sure, it does produce a little carbon when it's breaking down, but I would say that anaerobic digesters don't produce a high level of electricity to really supplement the, the need that, that's out there. You know, you're not talking like gigatons, you're talking like, you know, make megawatts you know so i will add to the so i agree we need both composting and anaerobic digestion and if there is space for everyone to have their own compost or at least a community compost area that is the goal the end goal but with urbanization and with the tourist industry especially in orlando where a lot of the people coming here aren't here to stay they don't they don't really care about where their food waste goes. That's where the anaerobic digestion and larger commercial composting facilities will help. So it's that interplay of both the large scale anaerobic digesters and commercial composters with those backyard compost. Composters are very important. And that's why Harvest Power and O-Town Compost need to, they both support the same idea. So food waste reduction and protect, um, reducing the methane gas from being put into the environment, but they do service different clients. So the Harvest Power will do commercial side and then um, O-Town Compost and smaller recycling facilities, food waste recycling facilities can do residential. And that's exactly what we see happening in Orlando. We would just like to see it all over Florida and all over the US. Yeah, and I totally agree with JD because, you know, commercial food waste is different from residential food waste. Um, you know, that's exactly how I hope things progress is a partnership between the two produce the processors. And for those of you that want to uh, compost at home or um, another resource is makesoil.com, where there were these amazing uh, tech gurus who had a little bit of extra money and a little bit of extra time and decided to make a free portal to create compost stations where you basically can drop a pin wherever your compost bin is and you can put different stipulations on there if you want people to drop off uh, food waste at your house or at your soil site, or if you don't, or if there's any restrictions on what they can drop or what have you. Um, this way, the whole world can be connected on their soil making processes. And it even has like a chat component. So you can talk to other people if you're experiencing any issues or any pests or anything like that. So makesoil.com is a really cool resource that I know with fleet farming, we are going to make a soil site in Audubon Park and we're going to use make soil and kind of write a blog about our journey and see if people start to utilize the portal. Um, so stay tuned for that. 
And if you do want your own compost bin, though you don't necessarily need one, the city of Orlando does give out free composters if you just go to our website and make sure you're within the city of Orlando. Uh, we also do free drop-off locations for food waste um, at the markets. You can also look online to find those locations and times. So now we're going to hop into a bit of a, a lightning round. So hopefully you guys can keep your responses to like one minute in total for each of these questions. Can we try? Okay. So first one we also have from a viewer, they said, how can they get their um, local farmers who show up to the farmer's markets to stop using plastic or reduce the plastic that they package their goods in? Real quick, I would just say, you know, have the conversation with them, ask them, have they looked into an alternative to the plastic? Um, just a simple, you know, question, not judgmental, but simple. I would say ask just to have whatever they have without the container that it comes in. So they see that they don't have to use that container, whether it be plastic or not plastic. And at the end of the day, they save money not giving that other piece of container away. Um, it, you know, being that we have at Fleet Farming have done the food policy courses, you know, there is certain le levels of liability with not having containers around some of your produce, depending on who you're selling to. So there might be a liability issue, um, but you can always ask if you can go to their farm location and purchase directly. I know somebody posted in the chat that Frog Song allows you to do that. Fleet farming, you can come anytime and harvest and take propagations and cuttings and things like that. Hmm. Um, next, we have a question on why don't um, MRFs, also known as manufacturing companies, invest or upgrade their separation systems? Money. <laughs> not enough money. And Very not everybody money. wants to pay taxes at the rate that we would need to to innovate in that way, I believe. Yeah, I mean, there's robotic automated arms out there that pick at like, you know, 100 picks a minute. And it's a, a total efficient way to pick out recycling and make sure it's clean. They have like a 99% accuracy rate and machine learning. But yeah, they're expensive. Like for one of these arms, it's a million dollars. And most um MRF owners, most recycling center owners don't have that kind of money. I mean, they'd have to sell a lot of aluminum cans to get there. So next question is the do's and don'ts of composting when you first begin. Um, I would say you got to start, you know, it's basically a man and a, or a woman with a pitchfork, you know, so make sure you're not adding meat or dairy. Um, O-Town Compost accepts that, but we have a more advanced system. Um, I would say you got to turn it pretty regularly, maybe twice a week. And um, make sure that your carbon Carbon is your wood chips or leaves or peat moss. Your carbon to nitrogen ratio is about two to one or three to one. And your, your nitrogen being the food waste. And keep it moist, you know, 50% moisture level. You don't need to worry during this time of the year in the summer. But during the dry season, you would need to worry about it. And the last thing is, you know, just have faith because you're not going to get those rodents and pests unless it's composting properly. Um, it's not going to be smelly unless it's composting properly. If it's smelly, it's anaerobic. If it, it's getting pests, it's because it's not hot enough. So just know you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember too that nitrogen is wet and carbon is dry. So the more wet it is, the more smelly it usually is. So you kind of want to balance the ratio for every one wet, you're going to want to put two dry. And dry could be 
you know, mulch or cuttings of different leaf debris or paper, whereas the wet is your food scraps, right? That fresh uh, or, you know, uh, plant matter. And, um, you know, composting in general, just you have to try it. You have to take pictures. You have to post some different, you know, uh, gardening groups, you know, your, whether or not you're doing something right or wrong. And that's how you learn at the end of the day is just being brave enough to start somewhere. Um, of course, the more that you notice different things, the more you can elevate your methodologies. And if you want a more in-depth kind of class or lecture about composting, the city also offers free composting classes. You just have to look on our website and register for them. They're completely free. And they're from, I believe, UF IFIS that does uh, their extension program, teaches those classes. And they're amazing. I've gone to like five. They're great. Well, to end off, Lori, can you introduce some yeah. tips? Thank you guys. Um, so just to touch end off this panel, we want to ask you guys any final tips that you guys have for the audience to be able to incorporate these actions into their lives. I would say try not to get overwhelmed because that if you do get overwhelmed, then that's usually when people call it quits. Um, if it's something that's difficult for you, take it one step at a time. So if you wanna reduce your plastic, then say cut out plastic bottles for a week and see if you can make it that week. Um, if it's easy, continue on to something else. If you're someone who likes to quit cold turkey, go for it. If it works for you, then it works for you. But I think don't be pressured to suddenly change your entire lifestyle because of the things that we're sharing or because you believe that the world's going to end if you don't. I think that kind of mentality really drags progress down. So being kind to yourself, first of all, and understanding that you can make mistakes and it will be okay. And just that it's a learning curve and you will improve as you continue to practice more sustainable habits. And uh, that's usually what I tell people and I wholeheartedly agree. To share on my experience, um, you know, I'm the cold turkey kind of person. So I, you know, went around my house and just looked at everything that I'm doing that I don't like that I'm doing and tried to do research and make drastic changes all in one day. So, you know, I bought a big order of who gives a crap toilet paper, which is that recycled toilet paper. I went and learned a recipe on how to make a year's worth of laundry detergent uh, out of a $30 recipe. You know, I, I wanted to make drastic changes, getting bamboo toothbrushes and all these things so that I can be a guinea pig and help educate other people. And I think that's something that, you know, as you're doing these slow changes and checking your behavior, advertise it publicly because social media can be a powerful tool for good and for evil. So why not be on the good side and try to educate people and be a peer and a mentor to them to have a, a smaller impact on this planet? Yeah, and I would say um, prioritize composting, number one, recycling, number two. Even if you have a back backyard compost bin, um, you know, that's a lot better to keep your material close and look as you compost. To It's kind of a dual system to also be growing your own food. I mean, we live in Orlando where it's an awesome climate for growing things year round. So uh, once you just enter that realm of consciousness of recycling nutrients back into the soil where they came from, I mean, you're just doing the best you can as a, uh, as a environmentalist. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thank you for your time, Charlie, Lee, and JD. And thank you, of course, to Ideas for us for um, co-hosting this event with us. Um, let me give a shout out to, of course, the city of Orlando and the fact that they're supporting these practices. Of course, with Charlie, please go out there and support and start composting and sending him um, materials so that you can get some of that compost back. And if you're not already a member, and ideas for us. It is a great, great organization. 
So please come and join us. Um, thank you guys again. And that is all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.